Lisa Mitchell. Hey, what's up? How are you doing? Uh, I, you know, feeling kind of complex. Do you remember, do you remember hearing about the Pueblo Regional Center there? No. What is up with the Pueblo Regional Center? Okay, so the Pueblo Regional Center two years ago was being investigated because they were raping and carving into the, the adults with disability there and everything. And, of course, the, the police department failed everybody there and the DA as well. Well, today they want a settlement. They want a million-dollar judgment against the Pueblo Regional Center for strip searching and abuse and rape and everything else, and it was all covered up by the law enforcement and the DA. Yeah, I did hear about the million dollar settlement. It's like, I, I've, I'm happy. It's I have mixed mixed feelings as a, as a citizen. As a citizen, I pay taxes, and so it's like great. Right. That's less money for social services. But on the other hand, good, good. They got a million dollars. They deserve it you know, for being raped. And you said carving, and probably who knows what else is going on there. They carved in. They carved into their bodies, and they blamed it on paranormal, paranormal activity. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? So then, uh, that's like gaslighting. They it on fictitious, imaginary people that did it to these people. And then they bet they. It's all. Uh, uh, they probably taught about I uh, individual empowerment too. It's all on you. And then meanwhile, you know, they're putting all this uh, crazy. Pr they're doing crazy things to them. Sadistic, crazy things to them. Getting them yeah. all riled up. And then making them look as if they're crazy because they're actually uh, rationally exactly. reacting. Yeah, that's, so that's exactly that's exactly it. And and you know, and I've been um, I've been upset because I was trying to work with the people who were going after them. But at that time, El Pueblo had been shut down. But you know, I've been I've been blowing this whistle for since 2009. And so I'm wondering, what, you know, like I've, I've been posting on the articles about the Pueblo Regional Center. Don't forget the kids at El Pueblo. Everybody's just forgotten about them. You need to get a bigger whistle. I know it, damn it. I had to go down there. Um, I had to go down there the other day, and I saw that the El Pueblo is still all boarded up. Um, so, and I'm not sure if it's, it, it's saying something about it being sold, but it was boarded up and I didn't see any activity, so I'm hopeful that possibly something's stopping that. You know, maybe something, a real investigation. I want you to know that they even found that people were dying at the Pueblo Regional Center, and they cremated their bodies before police even did a full investigation on them. So were people dying or were they being killed? So they were, so what happened was, is it similar to Samuel's story, and it's what I was reporting all these years with the Medicaid fraud, the drugs that they would give these disabled people, they would give them like multi-cocktails, and their valves would be obstructed, and they would die from that. They would die from, uh, basically these drugs would constipate the people so badly they couldn't even go. And they would die from that. There is and they a... were doing it to one of the kids that was in our lawsuit. So they damaged this child's body by the drugging. Right. And he had to have a colostomy bag from now on. He's a child. The most vulnerable child out of all the children, too. Right. And he and and so what? That's what I was. I, that's what I was blown. The whistle line is there is a prescriber there in Pueblo. Who was grossing just one year alone quarter of a, a quarter of a million dollars in pharmaceutical kickbacks and bribes to prescribe drugs that the Justice Department sued and were not FDA approved for pediatric use, but they just kept doing it and then billing it to Medicaid and committing massive Medicaid fraud. And I had to go over their head. And finally, the OIG came in and went after Kaufman. For the Medicaid fraud. So, I mean, you know, this is kind of what I've been dealing with. Did you ever get a chance to look at my website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually, uh, that's what I'm calling you about. So I want to get um, everything on record. So let's let's talk. Okay, that sounds good. So first and foremost, what did you think about the website? You live in Pueblo. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, it, there's a lot of information there. 
and it seems like it, you're very passionate, so you're uh, posting a whole bunch of stuff. It seems a little disorganized, um, uh-huh. not not because it is, but I guess I don't really know what I'm looking for, and so I want to kind of just get the overall understanding of what this whole deal was with the El Pueblo Boys and Girls Club, because it got shut down, and it's the exact same thing as this regional center. The Basically, I mean, it's de- developmental uh, children, and, uh, you know, so the most vulnerable children out there, there's abuse, and they just said in the papers just that they were strip-searched, and so uh, to see any signs of abuse, well, that did scare me. It made it sound like, to me, that they read the article or they read a report about somebody having a, you know, some bruise on their arm and then they're looking like, okay, who's the rat? Who snitched on us? Exactly. And, and that's, they... That's pretty much what happened. Well, and, you know, I mean, I'm going to try not to go all over the place, but I was trying to be very thorough. Basically, I wanted to separate the dead from the living. You know, first of all, you got to find out who's alive, who's not alive anymore because this was a 67-year racket, 57-year racket. It's been running since the 60s. So you got to, you know, my first my first thing was to start separating the dead from the living so we could hold them accountable. And we want a grand jury. That's what we want. We want a grand jury um, out of this. We want an investigation done on the, the people. And being a former fraud investigator, so I'm going to look at things a lot different than most parents do. Um, so I separated the dead from the living, and then I started putting them in compartments, you know, Pueblo government, federal government, which would be Medicaid, Social Security, because our kids were exploited with their benefits. Okay, let's let's take a Social Security benefit. Let's take a step back and let's uh, let's take it from the top. So you're let's see, you're Lisa Mitchell, and you have a son who is at the facility for five years. And it, uh, there was a lot of abuse that had happened, and then it got shut down um, last November, year. November of last year, 2017. November of 2017, which was a major victory for you because you had right. been talking about this and nobody had been paying attention. What's crazy yeah. is that it's kind of there's um, silence, radio silence here. Uh, about the El Pueblo Boys and Girls Club. It was here. It got shut down. There's all these politicians. You would think somebody might, you know, make an issue of it. It's child abuse. And so that makes me wonder if the 80%, I once heard that 80% of America believes in corporal punishment. And I'm wondering if it's like, I don't know, behind closed doors. So anyways, who who's mostly responsible? Who, uh, or I, I don't know if we, we should start with that. Who's mostly, or what happened? Let's talk about what happened, I guess, specifically with your son while he was there. Okay, so so basically my son was taken in what they call as a no fault. I wasn't accused of anything. And he was put there um, by Will County, up Greeley. And they put him in there in a no fault in 2009. Uh, now, how he got on the radar, uh, the court system was, I had him in a treatment center. I didn't know that they weren't supposed to be prescribing these psychotropic drugs for children. My son was on a cocktail at that time. Uh, I wasn't aware that the Justice Department was going to sue the pharmaceutical companies, and I wasn't aware that doctors were receiving pharmaceutical kickbacks to drug these kids. Uh, so so that, he that's was, how my story began. He was already so on... Was, go ahead. He was already on these psychotropic drugs before, so you had taken yeah. him to somebody and he was prescribed them, and they said that they called you out on it or something? Was he pres- no, so basically he was put on him when he was sick oh. by a doctor who was receiving pharmaceutical kickbacks in Texas, and I didn't know what I knew back, you know, back then. I, I had no idea back in 2003 what was going on, and a lot of people did, and a lot of this stuff didn't come out until about 2010, 11. Well, anyway, I had him in a treatment center there in Greeley, and he resisted a face-down restraint in the parking lot, parking lot, which is illegal. And the police came out, charged him with third-degree assault, and at this time, Ken Buck was the prosecutor there in Greeley. And, of course, my son, being 10, was incompetent, and the charges were dropped. So he was sent to El Pueblo with no charges. Why? Why was he? Uh, why was he? It sounds like he was assaulted and tackled by some uh, insane, uh, sadistic adults. Yes, and so he was being faced 
What did he do? What was the charge? What did he do? What was it? What did he do? Why did they feel the need that they had to take him down like that? Because he didn't want to sit in the back seat of the car. He wanted to sit up front uh, with the therapist that was bringing him to my house for a family family session. He said he was scared, which is what these drugs will make these kids feel. They'll make them feel delusional. It'll make them feel hyper. It'll make them. And some of the drugs that they were giving these kids would hypersexualize them. Uh, such as Abilify or Wellbutrin. I mean, Adderall has been deemed nothing more than meth. Abilify is like cocaine, etc. Even then, so, even then, I mean, I could understand if somebody was saying get in the back seat, that would make me worried. <laughs> Why am I getting in the back? Yeah, We're not friends no more. He was little, so, you know, he had to sit in the back seat for safety, but he wanted to sit by his therapist. He actually liked her. Sure. And I was very involved, and I would go in and tuck him in, you know, at, at night, and I could take him out, and I could bring him to the house and everything. I mean, there, it wasn't like he was on lockdown, like El Pueblo. It was nothing like that. It sounds uh, uh, sinister. It sounds disgusting. It sounds it sounds soul crushing. It sounds horrible. It is soul. It is soul crushing because he was my baby, and he had a he, he had a traumatic brain injury from the umbilical cord, so he lost some cognitive abilities and was being disabled at six. I saw him and talking on those interviews, though. He he seems like if you didn't know any of this stuff, that he probably could uh, hold his own in a conversation, and you wouldn't even know. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he's he's learned how to function, and of course, that's another point that we need to make here. Now that he's psychotropic, he's off of all these psychotropics. He's mm -hmm. been off of them now for four years. He's a totally different person. So what got him into their radar, or what got us into this nightmare originally, was the drugging. Okay. That's what that's what really started our nightmare. We, well, then, didn't, we didn't understand, but it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So then at 11 <laughs> years old, he's sent to El Pueblo Boys and Girls Club because of the psychotropic or because of that incident? Because of that incident and the charges were dropped, and of course they continued to drug him, and then he was bounced into the... Uh, the, the, the the CMHIP, he was bounced, you know, back and forth. Uh, we had so many different doctors prescribing to him at time at, at different times too, and so they would take away they would take away a dose, up the dose, lower dose, add new doses. It was crazy. It was, but, but that's all been exposed. Now we know, and I changed some laws too. I worked with some people where they can't drug the kids in foster care like they used to, and they have to monitor it. And now we're seeing, other than Colorado, Colorado's not indicting uh, the psychotropic uh, kickback prescribers like other states are. And I'm very angry at Cynthia Kaufman and John Feathers for not going after these prescribers because the, um, the law says that they can't do that. Jeff Chosner is the district attorney here in Pueblo. So that he would be correct. the... Yeah. Yeah. The... Uh, so, yeah. So the, so let me get let me get back on track, and then we'll start getting into Jeff Chopner. So he was there in 2009. He was always covered in bruises. They broke his foot. They broke his arm. Uh, he had concussions. He had swollen testicles. He had, you know, everything that you can think of. And then all of a sudden, they start giving him HIV and STD testing. I'm wondering if he's being raped there. Uh, uh, El Pueblo, El Pueblo Boys and Girls Ranch was very good about everything was a secret. It was all concealed. Um, I, my parental rights were intact this entire time, and I was constantly demanding the medical records. Uh, I want to see what's happening with my kids. Uh, no one would give me anything. I would go to the police, I went to the sheriff, and I, I complained about his abuse. They would say, what do you want us to do, arrest them? You know, they, they just were very cocky. They were, you know, they were... Uh, yes, they yes, were I want you to arrest them. They are abusing my kid. They're not going to help you. Right. And then I went to the DA. I didn't know about the DA then, but I would go down to his office and I would beg the DA to prosecute and, and open it, you know, help, help me. And, of course, now I know why Jeff Chopner, uh, it was on the board of El Pueblo. He was also a big 
person. He's a very big person in Pueblo. He's on multi boards. He's the biggest person. He's the biggest person. Uh, he would be the person who uh, uh, gives the uh, charges, all the stuff that the sheriff arrests, and then uh, in between all the judges. So without him, That's nobody correct. goes to jail, nobody get any fines. So he's uh, his office, just his office, like I don't know the man personally, but just his office is um his opinion his his opinion goes into the very heart of what pueblo law is or is not that, that, that's correct and then he also runs multi he's on multi boards or involved in multi uh juvenile or youth programs or organizations there which is a direct conflict of interest and for a lot of people too, I mean, being on the board of El Pueblo, but yet being the person that's prosecuting these kids, that's a major conflict of interest. Wait, that's he's a the... huge conflict of interest. Wait, he's prosecuting the kids? Yeah, so what happened was that Sam was there for five, and a, for five and a half years, and in 2013, I finally got some help. The ACLU came in and saw that they were putting kids in solitary confinement. I had another organization that was looking into my son's abuse. I was finally winning something. You know, I was demanding the records because the court ordered them to give them to me and, and everything. Because, remember, again, I had my parental rights. I wasn't accused of a crime. He wasn't taken because I did anything wrong. And I just got really sick of hearing all the time and greedily, you know, you're a wonderful advocate. Nobody, you know... You know, you're a wonderful mother. Okay, well, great. Give me my kid's freaking records. You know, give me so I can see what you're doing to him because he's in hard condition. He was starved. I was taking food. He was hungry. He didn't have underwear. He didn't have socks. He didn't have proper fitting clothes. And at this time, the guardian and items were supposed to be handling that. Uh, the agreeably uh, had taken away my social security because I had control of the social security. And uh, he was not being provided what he needed, and he was just in a horrid state. So what we, so what I suspect is when they abused him, they would put him in solitary confinement and prevent parents from going in and seeing their kids, so our kids could heal up enough to, to bring them out in daylight so we could take a look at them. That's disgusting. Um, and uh, you know, I was uh, 2013 is when my whole world just once again got shaken up upside down. I found an attorney, and we were going to start a lawsuit, um, and we tried to find more victims, more kids that wanted to join us. We had three other children that joined us in the lawsuit, and the moment that they caught wind that we were having a lawsuit, all ironically, all four of our children went to jail. Um, now, this is hard to say this because a lot of people don't understand El Pueblo was not a treatment center. They can lie and lie and lie. There's tons of facts and evidence I've, I've provided on my website. El Pueblo was a state-contracted private prison for children. So my son was false in prison there right. for five and a half years. So it's um, uh, Orwellian named. It's, uh, it's named the exact opposite of what it's actually doing. Exactly. It's not a treatment center. It's a jail. Right. And that explains why I was told that if I ran with my kid, I would be arrested. If I can't take him out of there, I would be I would be arrested. Uh, that explains to me why the police were and the sheriff were so rude to me. The DA was rude to me. Uh, it explains to me why the state attorney general wouldn't help because he had assistant attorney general um, uh, David Shaw that was deeply in, in bed, if not on the board of El Pueblo. So we got the state attorney general uh, directly on the board of El Pueblo and teaching El Pueblo how to file their taxes. Uh, massive corruption. You know, and we were go also going after Reggie Visa, who is the Department of Health and Human Services director for the entire state of Colorado uh, during this 2013 incident with it's, it's like a time span. It's like everything was exploding in 2013. I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to get my kid back. We're going to get the hell out of the state. Uh, we're going to sue. We're going to, we're going to, I'm going to get my wife back, my kids. I'm going to get my kid back. 
everything. Um, I'm a mother of four, and they only targeted my my youngest child, who, who is disabled. But that my other three stayed with me. So that's another conflict. I mean, if children are being removed from a parent, well, then how come they didn't take all four? Because they knew I was a good mom. And they, they had, I wasn't accused of anything, but there was nothing I could do. So back in 2013, we were going after the director, uh, Reggie Vita, uh, which I found out was from Wisconsin on child fraud allegations. And the legislator in Wisconsin voted him out. The governor protected him. And it wasn't, uh, he kept, he, he just kept staying on as their head director of uh, health and human services in Wisconsin with the media is what ran him out of that state, and so he went shopping for another state, and here he is right here in Colorado. And there has been nothing but child abuse, nothing but adults with disability abuse in this entire state since he has been the head director. And we want him fired. I don't want him to resign because he'll get a letter of res res uh, re um, resignation, and he'll, he'll just go to another state and just start all over again. I want him fired. If not criminally charged with, with the, what he's doing with the people here in Colorado as well. He gets paid for this and numerous failings under his direction. So that's, that's another thing. I, I guess I would say I'm a troublemaker. I don't look that way. I, I am, I'm speaking up for people who can't speak up. And mm -hmm. I am trying to change laws to protect children or people with uh, adults with disabilities or people who are maliciously prosecuted by dirty DAs or dirty cops, you know, arrested by, you know, I, I, I'm, I am trying my best to clean up what the injustice that's happening. So that's what started me into creating this website. When I got El Pueblo shut down last year in November, they started scrubbing their website. They started removing everything and getting rid of it and trying to hide who was all involved. And I had to start from scratch and compile them all, put them in categories. Um, you're right, it is a little disorganized. However, I'm, I'm setting a 60-year racket. And what? what kind of people does it take to keep a racket going? Yeah. It takes quite a bit. It, it takes a DA who prosecutes the innocent and protects the guilty. It takes law enforcement to uh, not assist a citizens in any type of um, any type of investigation of the citizens if they're being arrested. We, we are supposed to report fraud, abuse, and waste. And uh, this is a well-organized racket, as far as I'm concerned. Then you've got the judges on the board. The judges are sentencing these kids to uh, El Pueblo. Some of the judges were on the board of El Pueblo, and they were sentencing, sentencing these kids or ordering these kids to the very facility that they were running. Well, let's let's um. I got I got some notes here. So uh, uh, there was a, a lot of abuse there. The I heard heard your son said that he was knee striked and um, the there's kids getting punched and choked and all the the people would pinch him when they had him down on the ground. They were pinching him. So, uh, somebody got kicked with a steel toe boot. There was a report that one of the kids got kicked with a steel toe boot, and then it said that most employees ignored the problem. And then it says why DHS explains why it delayed shutting it down because they were hoping that it would uh, turn out to be good. Um, here's an interesting comment that I found that a former employee had wrote February 27th, 2018, so just uh, maybe a couple months ago, because uh, it's, immediately when the story broke, the, a lot of the staff came out and they were saying how sad they were because they're going to miss the kids. And that seems like that. It seems a little odd to me because uh, how many? I mean, there was a, the whole facility was like for 166 kids, but when they eventually closed down, there was only 37 there. So I'm just wondering, there couldn't have been that much staff for 37 kids if you just had 37 well, it, it people. You could like, have. It seemed like it was mainly the female staff, and from what I'm understanding, that the girls didn't have it as hard as the boys. And and if you ever study mm. anything about like discipline boys yeah. seem to get it boys seem to really get it harder in school or any kind you know the way society views boys or anything they they had it out for these boys 
Yeah, no, um, I, I understand that. It's but... really sad. Yeah, sure. Uh, and the girls were disabled as well. And then I also want you to be aware, and I want to say this, that the girls that were there, were. Uh, I talked to mothers of the girls. Yes, they were abused, so I, I'm not saying that they weren't, but it was mainly the female staff that were speaking out to keep the place open. Uh, but girls that were rescued in sex trafficking were sent, sentenced, ordered to El Pueblo, to this God-forsaken place, and they were victims of sex trafficking. This is outrageous, especially because of the abuse, the, uh, the starving, the children were being starved, they weren't giving, given proper portions, they were given nothing but junk food and crap, and then I, I have compiled on my website all of their fundraisers, El Pueblo's fundraisers where they were raising money all the time. And I want to add that when I finally got El Pueblo shut down last year in November, that they cashed out at $10 million. Where the hell did the money money go? Where, where did the money go where these kids didn't have adequate clothing, food, um, shoes, underwear? Um, and I want to add, too, that as parents were forced to pay child support. Child support. We funded our children's abuse, and if we didn't pay our child support, they threatened to take away our driver's license, and then we surely wouldn't be able to see our children, uh, because they moved my son from Greeley to Pueblo, which is about 300 miles away from me. Um, I had no choice but to pay the child support. Uh, there were times I had to hawk things to pay it. I was working, but I was also taking care of three other children, and plus going up there and feeding my kid, providing all his clothing, providing his shoes, his underwear, everything that he needed. It was almost like it was almost like being it, it was almost like a criminal racket. You're you're being extorted for things that they want, or you don't get to see your kid. Mm. And, they, and then when you see the condition of your kid. There's no one that's going to help you, but they want more from you. They want more from you. They drag you into court every six months and give you the illusion they're going to give you your kid back. You know, it, it's, it's a racket. It, it's just nothing but a racket. No, that There's sounds... Everybody got on that. the Trump administration for separating uh, families. His idea was to separate the kids to make sure that the parents... Like, it was a punishment to really hurt them to make a deterrent. And uh, people were rightly, you know, um, mad about that. But that's what you're saying is happening to Americans. I, I am, but I, but I want to say something that's different about the Trump administration. This has been going on under the last, you know, four, um, uh, four administrations. Uh, this is something that's been going on. It's been well organized. It's been a racket. It's been the way that they've been doing it. Uh, taking children away from their parents when parents haven't done anything wrong, denying parent trials. I asked for a trial. They denied me the trial. Uh, trying to get your kids back or trying to get even attorneys here in the state to help you is like pulling teeth. Uh, once the state has got their hooks in your child, you have no relief. The police won't help you. No one will help you except for you just constantly staying on this, demanding investigation, publicly posting, showing people what's going on. And, and as far as like the Trump administration, I look at it as a totally different deal. These people were here illegally mm -hmm. and put their children at risk and brought them here knowing that they were here illegally. Whereas parents like me, it's not our fault that our children are disabled. That's not our fault. We are legally here. Our children were born legally here, disabled, and they are treated as second-class citizens. And I look, it, it, I look at that as a black and white issue, not a gray issue. Yeah, no, I find it... Um... It's they do it in hospitals too. If uh, you have to have a uh, heart and surgery, so, if you have so heart surgery, though. If children have cancer, we need me going through this. The extortion. You know, they, your kids get all the help when they have cancers. There's all these organizations. Maybe, maybe I've the, heard of some people. Not when your kids disabled. I've they heard, I've heard of some organizations when you have to do like a heart uh, surgery. 
uh, there, there are some of them where they couldn't afford a thing, so it was just like you were saying, extortion too. So there, right. there are programs for people, but there's also people that, for some reason or another, aren't able to get a hold of those programs. I've heard of people have to take their kid in for some heart, you know, or um, right. I don't know about cancer, but I know if they had some heart treatment, then it was too much and they couldn't do anything about it because they didn't have the money. And so they felt like they were being extorted too, because it was either, yeah. do you want to take care of your kid? Do you want to fix your kid's heart? Or are you just going to watch a kid die right in front of you at home? Exactly. What do you, what do you do? And I do want to add that during that 2013, when I said everything was breaking loose, this organization uh, had listened to me. I said, they took my kid. They, they harassed. They threatened me. Just give us your kid. Turn your kid over. Relinquish the social security. Just give us everything. And, you know, we're going to take over from here. It's, what planet am I on? Um, and they did an investigation and found out that this state uses threats and harassment to remove children. And when, and when parents try to use their, you know, stand up or use their rights, they take the kids anyway. That's exactly what they did. They just went ahead and took my kid anyway. It wasn't legal what they did. Uh, but they did it anyway. And since El Pueblo was not a treatment center, it was a jail, my son was false in prison there for five and a half years. Do you have, um, um no have you, charges. Have Absolutely you, no charges against him. He was false in prison for five and a half years. And then, um, then I said, what I said is that when he 